Hi, everybody. Welcome to Judgment and Decision Making, part one. So we are going to talk mainly about ideas of persuasion and communication uh, in persuasion today. So the reason why this is such a big deal is because if you remember the, the history of social psychology, and we talked about the difference between Gestalt psychology and how they left Germany and they came to the United States around the same time as World War II. What they did is they applied certain um, uh, certain ideas about Gestalt psychology to uh, judgment and decision making. And we'll talk about this in a little bit. So the main thing that you need to, to know though is when we talk about attitudes, remember an attitude is an evaluation of an object. So what we're talking about here is changing somebody else's attitudes. So the person who's receiving the information is being influenced by whatever this uh, persuasive argument happens to be. So if the attempt is to change somebody's attitude through persuasion, then the persuasive communication is communicating one side of an issue or another, meaning they want to have a specific kind of attitude. They don't want just random change. They want attitude change one way or another. So, you know, most of the time when we think about this, we think about advertising, but it doesn't have to be advertising. It can be a speech. It can be uh, somebody trying to convince you to vote for somebody else. It can be trying to uh, change your opinions. It could be somebody trying to persuade you to marry them. I don't know, whatever it happens to be. They're trying to persuade you. They're trying to change your attitude about something through communication. The Yale Communication, communication Research Program. Those Gestalt psychologists who came over during World War II, a lot of them were employed by the Yale Communication Research Program. Now this was a government run program at Yale, which was meant to work on mass communication for the army during World War II. Now the mass communication didn't necessarily have to be like for the soldiers in World War II. A lot of it actually had to do with trying to persuade civilians during World War II to do certain things, to uh, think certain ways, to act certain ways. So, much of what they looked at was the rational or deliberative process involved in attitude change. What that means is trying to persuade someone through a good argument, right? Logically setting out your argument, saying here are the good reasons, etc. That means that we needed them to attend to the message, meaning they had to actually pay attention. That's attending to the message. They have to understand it, comprehend what is being said. They have to incorporate it into what they previously believed or thought. And they have to accept it and remember it to, later on. These three components, uh, the three components of a deliberative message or persuasive message that they were looking at had to do with the who, that's the source of the message, the what, what the content of the message was, and to whom, the audience of the message. And so what, remember, what they're trying to do is they're trying to persuade people about uh, things that they should be doing. Now, the reason why we say this is the rational deliberative process is because later on we're going to talk about the idea of just emotionally being uh, influenced by something or not even thinking about it, just doing it. Okay? That's coming up later on. But they started off with this idea of trying to rationally understand how these things are done. So let me give you an example of what they might have done. Oh, and also the conditions under which people would be influenced by it. Right, fine, good. All right, here's an example of the kind of issue that they would have uh, worked on. So this is uh, actually an advertisement in a magazine uh, during World War II, and here's what it's talking about. The meat on the table is that they're trying to persuade civilians, and in this case, uh, at the time, most of the people who were actually buying meat uh, were women, right? So women working as you know housewives uh, in the home. So a lot of what they're trying to do is persuade women to not buy the normal cuts of meat. By normal cuts of meat, I mean, you know, like the normal parts of the, of the animal that is normally eaten. Instead, what they're trying to convince people to do is eat the other parts of the animal that don't normally get eaten, at least not by Americans, right? That includes things like the brain, tongue, uh, intestines, stomach, the other parts of the animal. And the reason why they wanted to do this is because they wanted to make sure that they could conserve meat to make sure that they could uh, feed the army, right? And so the script that you see at the bottom of that advertisement is the actual argument itself, right? And so what, what they're trying to do is they're gonna say, all right, here's what we need to do. 
we need to figure out how we can convince housewives in the United States to start eating cow stomach. They have the reasons why, they have their own reasons why, it's for the military effort, but can you see how that might be a bit of a difficult process if traditionally that was not part of the cow that was being eaten? All right. So the first aspect of this that we need to talk about is the message characteristics. By the message, I'm talking about the actual argument itself, okay? The message characteristics. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is what is the content of the message that you actually communicate to the recipient? So first, that they found that the content of the actual message should be desirable yet novel consequences. So you want, it should be, there should be consequences to your message that the participant wants, the person wants, the receiver wants, but are new or different. They wouldn't get them through some other way. They want people, they want the message to be straightforward. They want an explicit con conclusion or an implicit argument that will allow a knowledgeable audience to reach its own conclusion. Anyway, it, it shouldn't be ambiguous what the conclusion is meant to be, right? So if it's buy war bonds, then it's buy war bonds. If it's start eating uh, entrails, then it's start eating entrails, right? Or you lead them along and you don't actually say starting entrails, but you, you say, hey, we need cuts of meat for the parts of the army. Look at these cuts of meat. They're very, very nutritious and they're not expensive and they're not being rationed by the government and they're readily available, and here are some recipes that you could use. We're not explicitly saying, go eat entrails, but you're especially, you're saying, all right, well, if this person understands what I'm talking about, they're gonna come to that conclusion. You generally should give vivid emotion, uh, vivid information that's emotional rather than statistical facts. So it turns out that people like vivid emotional things rather than facts, right? They don't like the long list, like I'm not being very persuasive right now, evidently, because I'm just giving you bullet points. But you should give vivid emotional information rather than just the statistical facts. All right. With this in mind, they came up with the idea of the identifiable victim effect. This is that when you're trying to persuade someone, instead of saying, overall, uh, if 85% of the population eat entrails, then 93% of the meat uh, can be used for the army. That's that's not what you do. Instead, you try and you try and give a story of one particular person. Okay, people tend to be more motivated by empathizing with one the situation of one specific person rather than this eighty five percent of people. So instead, you would say something like, um, "Mrs. Walker's son Bob uh, just attacked." The beach of Normandy. Uh, he he's been fighting to you know fighting against the Nazis for a week straight, and when he finally gets to camp, he's reassured to know that there's a good meal for him because his mom back home ate entrails. Something like that, right? The identifiable victim effect. So the victim of not eating entrails would be would be Johnny the soldier overseas right? Make it identifiable with a case study kind of an idea rather than just general general percentages. Okay, so we're going to give an example of this. This would be a content of a message. Let me warn you and let me warn the nation against, you can read it, right? You can read it yourself, but this would be the actual content of a message. Now you'll notice that I didn't tell you who said this. And I didn't tell you what its purpose was and who the audience was. Everything that we've discussed so far is the what, right? So this is the what, this is the what part of the message. It's quite different than the source characteristic. That's the who is saying it part of the message. So who says, the message is an important factor. If this is being said by, you know, some guy in, in ratty clothes on a street corner, it's gonna have a different effect 
than if it's said by a professional athlete or a famous actor or uh, a doctor or the president of the United States. Okay? All right, so the source characteristics means the characteristics of the source of the information, meaning the person who's saying it. These are independent. The persuasiveness of this is independent of the actual content of the message. Now, this sounds kind of silly to us now. Of course, that's kind of independent of it because we're used to people, uh, we're used to celebrities trying to sell us stuff that has nothing to do with what they, you know, what they actually do professionally. We know that those things are separated, but you know, in the 40s and 50s, that was not as separated. That was not quite as separated in its ideas. So the idea is that independent of the actual content of the message, source characteristics are important. So these include attractiveness, how attractive the person is. They include how distracted the, uh, somebody listening to them might be. The expertise of the person uh, saying, uh, giving the message, the trustworthiness of that person. And this brings in the idea of the sleeper effect. Now the sleeper effect is, can occur when a message comes from an unreliable source initially, but later is remembered later on if it is, you know, if it's a good enough, uh, if it's an you know, impactful enough message. So what this is saying is that generally you want your source to be attractive and be an expert and be trustworthy and those kind of things, right? The sleeper effect is saying that sometimes you can actually hear a message from an unreliable source, but later on when you actually make the decision, it can come, it can, you know, pop into your head and be persuasive. So if somebody says, you know, I'm not a doctor, but I play one on TV and people who, uh, and that's why I like Advil, right? Being a, not being a doctor, but you play one on TV gives you like no reliability as you, you have no expertise, right? Your trustworthiness is small. You might be attractive perhaps, but you really are not a trustworthy source in terms of what kind of medicine you should buy. So it might be that later on, if I go to the drugstore and I need to buy some uh, some headache medicine, I look around and like, ah, I remember something about Advil. Yeah, and Advil is good. The sleeper effect is that just having it, and even though it's from an unreliable source, later on, it can actually have an effect, right? It can kind of lie dormant in your mind and then suddenly come out when you need it to. Source characteristics though generally should be attractive, expert, trustworthy, and those are actually kind of separate from the content of the message. So what I want to do now is I want you to watch the actual message. So remember I showed you this message. Well, let's see it in context with its source. Go ahead and watch this video. So the person who was talking to you was Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and this was right before we entered World War II. Uh, and, it's, and he's giving his persuasive speech. Now, notice how the way he actually performed the speech gave a lot more information than just reading it or just giving the context of it. The source of the information is an important aspect of persuasion, an important one. Besides that, though, we also need to know the receiver characteristics. So who is receiving the information is also really, really, really important. Like whether they're gonna listen to you, whether they're really receptive or not. This includes the mood of what the people are in. So for example, the message content should match the goals and content of the mood of the recipients. So you can't just show up to a party and try and persuade people that they need to buy life insurance, right? It's gonna be hard to do because they're in a good mood, Nobody wants to think seriously about, you know, dying later on. That's that's not, you know, not going to be very persuasive. But if people are in a concerned mood, then giving them the content that that's okay, let me assuage your concerns, that's going to be much more effective. So the receiver of the persuasion, you need to follow their mood. Age is also an issue. I don't know if you know this, but to young people, much more susceptible to persuasion than adults or the elderly. Uh, adults and elderly people, they tend to be more jaded, more set in their ways, et cetera. They're, they're harder to, to persuade. They're less susceptible to things like advertisements and persuasion. So be careful 
uh, the age of the people and who you're targeting as your um, receiver of your of whatever this characteristic you're looking at. Okay, so here's what I want to do. I want you to look at these two advertisements and tell me which would be more effective for you. So you just looked at these two Coca-Cola advertisements. These are very old Coca-Cola advertisements. Now, what I want you to notice is the difference in the way that Coca-Cola is trying to give its message. So here on the left, you'll see that this is a pretty, uh, I don't know whether it's a very good argument, but this is a lot of content of the actual argument. So you're supposed to say, oh, this is me. And if this is me and I need refreshment and all that stuff, oh, I should go and ask for a Coca-Cola at the soda counter, right? Notice how they're trying to persuade you, et cetera, okay? On the right, all they're trying to do is give you an attractive woman who's drinking Coke. The left, there's actual content to the message. So this is focused on the content of the message. On the right, it's really just about the source characteristics. It's really just about, hey, I think she's attractive and either I'm attracted to her or I would be like to be attractive like her, right? And it's just about the source characteristic of it. Who you are and your motives, et cetera, are gonna be, uh, are gonna really be influential as to which one of these kinds of advertisements is more effective for you. In the next video, we're gonna talk about the difference between processing information about the actual argument versus just picking up on the source characteristics. So that's coming later on. Uh, it's important though to notice that these two advertisements are quite different. This one has, the one on the left has a whole lot about, here's the actual argument. The one on the right has like nothing, very much. It's just saying it's delicious and refreshing. It's really just about the source characteristic saying, hey, attractive equals Coke. All right, why and when source characteristics, message characteristics and target characteristics play a role in attitude change. So how does it actually occur? Those three elements, the source characteristics, the receiver characteristics and the actual message content, those three things are important, but it kind of depends on the mixture of what's happening with the receiver, what's happening with the content, what's happening with the source. All those things are important aspects of it and can be mixed up in different ways. So a lot of this has to do with ideas of rationality. So I want you to, I want to ask you this. Do you always pay attention to advertisements? Of course you don't always pay attention to advertisements. Does anybody really pay attention to all those advertisements? Well, why don't you do that? Well, the reason why is because you are bounded. There's, these are different psychological uh, aspects in the way you're bounded. That is you're limited, right? There's certain limitations to how rational you can be how much willpower you have, how self-interested you are, how ethical you are, how just cognitively aware you are. And those things, because they are bounded, because they're limited. Remember we talked about cognitive resources and how you can't, you know, you, you're sometimes limited on how much you can process information because you only have so many cognitive resources. Well, rationality is also limited. Willpower is limited. Self-interest, limited. Ethicality, limited. Awareness, limited. At least many people believe that these things are bounded, they're limited. And based off of how limited you particularly happen to be, you are or you are not going to pay attention to an advertisement or any other persuasive communication. If you don't want to, if you feel like you can't pay attention to anything anymore, then you're not going to spend those resources paying attention to an advertisement that has nothing to do with you. If you're only a little bit self-interested, then certain advertisements really aren't going to appeal to you, right? If your willpower is really low, you actually might be more susceptible to an advertisement. Bounded just means that these aspects of us are, are limited. That's all it means, that they're, that they're limited. Now, to be fair, I wanna make sure I'm clear about this. Some people think that some of these things are actually not limited. So for example, some people believe that willpower is not limited. Uh, just people have to think of it as an unlimited source and that makes it more available to you, that kind of a thing. But certainly we know that people act in a bounded way. They don't always act as if they have the same amount of ethics, awareness, self-interest, et cetera, and those are bounded by certain things. Okay, let's go ahead and stop there.